Good morning. Uh, like most times in my life, I find myself at a bar at 10 in the morning on a Saturday. Uh, so let, let's, let's start from there. Uh, my talk is called The Product is a Byproduct. And my, my initial statement here is, you know, you can create a great product, but it's better to grow one. These products come together with like a, all right, that doesn't make any sense. People like talking about products and stuff, and I, it, it's really silly to me. Uh, this is what I'm trying to say in my text that comes up way too late on this screen. Uh, you should worry more about building something, uh, and you should worry less about what that something is. In other words, I think a product should be a, a byproduct of the people process and technology that you have set up at your company. Um, so rather than focusing on like, okay, how do we make this best product ever? How do we do a great design and all this sort of stuff? Uh, that stuff's all important, but how you structure your company, how you structure um, you know, your team, all of that stuff ends up being a better way to end up with a better product overall at the end of things. So I'm gonna talk about that today. Uh, basically, if you foster a good environment, you're more likely to create a good product from that good environment. It's sort of the backwards way of looking at product development. I think it's uh, more rewarding. So this is me, this is uh, me at our dodgeball team at GitHub. Uh, you can't laugh at me because we raise money for charity. So like, apparently if you do stuff for charity, like, you, know, you can wear short shorts and it's really funny. Uh, so I'm holding on Twitter, holding on GitHub, all of that fun stuff. And I do work for GitHub. Uh, this isn't really a GitHub talk, uh, but I do a lot of talks about how we work, how open source works, uh, sort of how we go as an organization. Um, so yeah, GitHub's really cool. I've been there for three years in about a week or so, which is, I guess, eons in the tech industry sometimes. Uh, so it's been fun. So first I want to talk about the team. Because people tend to say, you know, People are important. That's what every chump on stage gets on stage and says. Uh, so I'm going to say it too. Uh, you know, people are very important. People are very critical. Uh, who you end up working with on a day-to-day -day basis is sort of the foundation of literally everything else. Uh, this is the GitHub team circa about six months ago. Uh, we've added probably 20 or 30 on since this point. Uh, we're now at 150 people, uh, which is crazy. But this is my team. This is my family. I love all these fine, classy ladies and gentlemen. Um, and Kyle Neath, one of our, he's sort of like head of design at GitHub, um, a few months ago said this in our chat room, and he said, uh, there are a thousand developers who are extremely smart and talented, all of whom I would never ever hire here. And I thought that was sort of indicative of how we treat these sorts of things. Um, all too often when people start saying, you need A players in order to you know, get the best product and stuff like that, uh, people tend to focus on really weird stuff. Um, and there's been a lot of people I've interviewed who are technically competent, but they're just jerks, or they're just, they don't have, you know, they're not a breadth of knowledge. And it's important to sort of figure out that, like, you know, an A, an a team, or an A player is not necessarily, you know, the best and brightest. Um, you can contribute in other ways, and those other ways are sometimes more uh, important than the other, you know, low-level stuff. Uh, one thing we sort of talk about informally at GitHub is we like to hire people who are bothered by suck. And by that I mean, if something sucks, if you have to deal with something every day, we like to hire people who get fed up with that. And they like to automate it, they like to fix it, build applications around it so they don't have to deal with that sort of stuff. Uh, it ends up being really good. We want fixers. Uh, we want people to work at a company and not really be happy with sort of the status quo. Uh, we don't have any managers in our 150 people, so it's sort of on us to sort of say, you know, there's something that isn't working here, and if we had people who weren't, you know, bothered by suck, uh, bothered by, you know, things that weren't working well, uh, we wouldn't work as well as a team. Uh, so this has been a really good for, uh, thing for us to just figure out that, you know, that's how people, you know, this is the type of people we want at GitHub. Uh, Valve, Valve leaked their employee handbook, leaked their employee handbook about a year ago, which was fascinating because they got lots of press for it, uh, hence the leak square, scare quotes. Uh, but it was awesome for us because we've been working in this sort of fashion for a long time, this sort of very distributed fashion. Uh, and Valve's handbook leaked and we kind of realized we worked in a very similar sort of fashion. Uh, part of what they said in their handbook was, anytime you interview a potential hire, you need to ask yourself not only if they're talented or collaborative, but also if they're capable of literally running this company, because they will be. And even in companies that are very top-down, with, with strong leadership or managers or whatever the, the case is, I think 
you know, it's kind of the old adage that, you know, it, the people down at the bottom who know the dirt tend to run things. Uh, those are kind of the important decisions, the really boring day-to-day -day decisions. Uh, so hire people that, you know, you're confident you can just say, here, run this company and then do s stuff like that. Um, hire broad people. Uh, this is sort of gets back to the idea that we don't necessarily want just the best and brightest. We want smart, broad people. Uh, Valve in their handbook calls this T-shaped people. So, and the, the arm stretched out is the broadness. Meaning, you know, I know, you know, all these different languages, different frameworks, different ways of working. I want to be really broad in that. But the still vertical section of the body is depth. So maybe I'm really good at email processing or something. You want to have somebody who's an expert in that, but very broad in other ways. Uh, because that ends up paying back in lots of different fashions down the line. So T-shaped people, broad people is really important for us. Uh, diversity in general is just really critical. I wish more people would pay attention to this sort of stuff. Um, there's a bunch of fun studies. Uh, this is my dabbling in academia because I'm not an academic. But there's a lot of really good studies about this sort of stuff. And one of them concluded that groups exposed to minority views were more creative than the more homogeneous majority groups. Uh, in other words, you know, if you have more diversity, you're going to make more creative decisions to problems. You're going to consider more viewpoints. Uh, more up-to-date study, specifically looking at startups and companies, uh, they looked at successful ones. And they looked at, they found that the overall median proportion of female executives in successful companies is 7.1% compared to 3.1% at unsuccessful companies. What I'm saying here is just diversity in general is good. You end up with a better... Uh, position in society to do better things. Uh, this actually impacts your bottom line, basically. There's always the people like, yeah, that would be nice, but you know, we, we want to make a lot of money or something like that. And what I'm saying here is that this will make you more money. It's great. Uh, so worry about that. Build a company that's friendly to everybody. Uh, and this sort of impacts things more than just you know, the superficiality of stuff. Uh, this impacts a lot of stuff. Like, how do you position yourself as a company? How do you Talk about the tone of your company. Um, there's another study that looked at job, um, wait, is that that one? Yeah, they looked at job postings. Like, I would like you to work for my company. And they found that increases in masculine wording was sufficient to decrease women's job appeal. Uh, in other words, if you do stuff like this, can't see them as much, but that says badass, killer, rock star, dominant. You know those job postings, like we need rock star people and stuff. Uh, it's not as good as people who talk about happiness or honesty or you know, working together and being flexible. Uh, and that's, you know, it's, it's a subtle thing. And I think that's important to talk about. And the best thing about this is it works for everyone else too. I think that's sort of the, the, best, say, if you, or the best thing if you're talking about we want a really diverse company. If you can build your company in a way where that appeals to everybody, that's fantastic. Like I would much rather talk about, I want to work, work at a company that talks about happiness, not about killer rock star badass developers or something, which just makes me laugh. Um, so consider your approach, uh, both in job postings, how you deal with stuff at work, um, all of these sorts of things. Because I think our industry in general is just really bad at this sorts of stuff. Uh, also, I hate programmers. I just wanted to point that out. I, I, just, I don't know why this industry is so, I think it's kind of the media, just like, oh, there's the rise of the programmer, which is really weird. Uh, anyway, they're horrible. Okay, so that's team. Let's talk about a little culture a little bit. It's the other side of the token that's really important to me. Uh, you know, this, all of this stuff, you know, crushing and, you know, throwing down a code and, you know, doing all this, I, no, it's, it's stupid. Um, we don't really focus on time at all at GitHub. We have very, you know, healthy work-life balance, uh, which is great. Uh, there's a lot of reasons for that. Good culture attracts good people. And if you build a culture where you have to work overnights. Uh, and you, you know, this is really big in like gaming companies, for example, where they'll work you know, a billion hours a week. Uh, I think that's just bad culture. Uh, you can do a lot more better work with less hours, ironically enough. Uh, also, people will like mate with other humans and then create offspring. Uh, it's kind of weird. It's probably less of a big deal here as it is in the Valley. Like, people forget this. Like, people will create kids. And that fact alone, like a lot of companies that I know are just like, uh, whatever, come to work. You know, you don't need to do all that kid stuff. Uh, that's horrible. Uh, this is Scott's daughter who is adorable. Um, this is good. Be family friendly. Be a family friendly company. Uh, this is at one of our, we have two summits every year where we bring everyone uh, remote into San Francisco. 
we try to make a number of these events family friendly, so I get to see everyone's kids or their dogs, or we just go in and chill. Uh, that becomes really critical to building a company that I want to work at because I want to know, you know, what your family's like. I want to, you know, know more about you. Uh, that's just it's it's very gratifying to see this sort of uh, relationship sort of grow in a company. Uh, being flexible. Uh, that is sort of the, the main point behind building a company that works with like a family friendly company. Uh, there's three main areas of doing this, location, uh, hours, and workload. For us, we're about two thirds remote. Um, and then of that, maybe in San Francisco, half the people in San Francisco will go to the office. So we're very much, you know, work wherever you want to work in the world. We have stuff, people all over the world. We have people traveling the whole time and they're kind of homeless. Uh, that's good, that means you can sort of Work from home if you want today. Um, or work from Lincoln, Nebraska or something like that. It's awesome. Uh, hours are also really critical for us because, you know, if you ever had one of those jobs where you have to come to work at like 9 in the morning and you're not a morning person, uh, I'm bitter about this because this is one of my jobs. And, you know, you had to come in for the stand-up meetings at 9 a.m. and I was horrible at times, so I'd always come in at like 10 a.m. They'd get mad at me. And then by the time you're done with the stand-up meeting, it's like an hour till lunch, so I just browse Reddit for an hour because I can't get into anything. Uh, it's frustrating. Um, some people are naturally going to be morning people. Some people are naturally going to be only productive between midnight and 6 a.m. Uh, and for us, it's really good to just say, yeah, work whenever you want. Uh, we sort of built the company in a way to let people work on the hours that they're productive. And if they're not productive in the morning, why are you making them come in? You're not going to end up with better code for doing so. Uh, finally, just sane workload. As I mentioned before, I've never done an all-nighter at GitHub or anything silly or remotely close to that because I think you just produce be uh, worse product if you're you know, stressed. Uh, we don't tend to do deadlines at all. Um, you know, the, the work is done when it's ready to ship. And that changes your entire worldview when you're not stressed out about, oh, this has to be done at the end of the week. You can sort of you know, build it till when it's really something you can be proud of. Uh, that becomes really important. So all this stuff, you limit yourself with you know, geography if you say you have to be in the office every day. You limit yourself with all these work hours and a really stringent workload. Uh, that ends up creating a company that just has bad culture overall. There's a great story about this. Um, so Apple went to Intel machines, uh, I don't know, six years ago at this point or something like that. And you know, that was a really big switch for them. And the story behind why that happened was fascinating because some dude had been at Apple for about 13 years, and he's like, well, you know, I'm kind of sick of being on the West Coast. I just had a kid. I want him to be close to his grandparents, my parents on the East Coast. So he emails his boss, and he's like, hey, you know, is there some sort of project I can work on? Like, I kind of want to do, like, OS X on Intel. Uh, is that something you're interested in? And his boss, to his credit, is like, yeah, sure, whatever. You know, we like you. You know, work on what you want to work for a while. And 18 months go by, and then uh, his boss is like, yo, we have to justify uh, what you've done for 18 months. Come on in and you know, show us what you've done. So he shows up uh, you know, OS X booting on an Intel machine. And his boss is like, okay. He brings his boss's boss and he's like, oh, all right. He brings his boss's boss. And then people were so impressed by this, Steve Jobs was on a plane that day basically to, to go to Sony in Japan to talk about all this sort of stuff. Um, but the cool thing about all that, I think, is just, you know, this all stemmed from a self-demoted engineer who wanted to send Max to be able to live closer to Max's grandparents. Uh, when you think about like, how critical this is, I mean, that in some respect probably means why Apple has gotten so big in the last decade or so. It's because they switched to Intel machines and their laptops are awesome now. That all stemmed from some guy just saying, you know, I want to be a little bit more flexible for a little bit. And the fact that they were able to accommodate that was great. Um, I think it's really interesting with uh, Marissa at Yahoo saying you can't work remotely now. Uh, you know, they can't have experiences like this that Apple did. Uh, all of that stuff's really fascinating to me. Apple was flexible and it worked out for them and it kind of changed the entire industry because of this one guy. Cool. Once you've built stuff, uh, I think you have to sort of raise desire about the product. And the reason why people build stuff is for other people to use it. Uh, marketing is not a bad word. I think like developers and techie types like to say, oh, marketers, they're the worst. Uh, but inherently, it's not bad. Like people like to talk about stuff. Like I want to know what cool apps you guys all use because you know, then I can use it. 
inherently people are very social and want to know what's cool, what's out there. So that's not inherently bad. Uh, I don't really have much to say about this. I just wanted the photo to like work. Uh, that's cool. Uh, we hate the disingenuous. That's why we hate marketing, because we feel like the person who's a quote unquote marketer is disingenuous. Uh, you know, you're, you're just less pleased with dealing them that way. Uh, so if some guy is, comes up to you in like his suit and he's like, I want to build a distributed social cat network. And you're like, one, what does that even mean? But you ask some questions like, do you even have a cat? Like you're trying to market this to me, but do you even have a cat? Like why would you want to talk to, why do you want to do that? Like do you, don't we want to centralize cats? Cats are already decentralized. Have you ever tried to catch a cat? They're all over the place. We should probably centralize them. Uh, you know, would you even use this yourself? That's usually what it comes down to for me. Like every time you deal with like a salesman or something, and you're like, man, this product is horrible. Would you even use this yourself? And then you kind of feel like he's like, no, but he's still pushing on you. That's why we don't like this idea of marketing. But I still think it's really important. And I think the, the core of all this stuff is just being genuine. Being genuine about how you market your company or your product. And I think it ends up being a, a strength for you rather than some weird drawback that people cringe at. Uh, a really good story that I had recently was with 1Password, the password manager for stuff. I love 1Password. So they emailed me like, I don't know, what? It's fantastic. Uh, they emailed me like four or five months ago and they're like, check out this point release update of 1Password. And like, honest to God, I did not care. Like it was, it was all involving features that weren't that interesting to me. But I was reading through this email and it was from like their CEO or founder or something like that. And he was so ridiculously excited about you know, this dumb little feature that I'm never gonna use. And even though I'm not necessarily a user of that particular feature, it was exciting because he was very genuine about how he was positioning himself, how he was you know, trying to get across that he's super excited, his whole team's excited, they got some cool stuff in the future. Um, and that's amazing. That's a case for me of where you know, I already like the company, and even though the product wasn't for me necessarily in that little specific version update, but I came off from that email, it wasn't just another marketing email that I get you know, 20 times a day or whatever. It was somebody who was really genuinely interested and that's contagious and I have a much better feeling about uh, the company now. Uh, I found that really fascinating and I think there's not enough of these types of stories anymore. Uh, being vocal, um, and this goes for company stuff uh, and for just individual projects. If you want to be really stereotypical uh, as a nerd, which we're probably all some level a nerd in here, uh, we tend to be more introverted and more reserved and stuff like that, which I think is you know, a good thing. And not everyone's this way, but um, there's just a lot of people who don't necessarily toot their own horns, uh, which is good, but on the other hand, like, it's, I have a bunch of friends who will produce really cool like, small open source projects I'm like, you should talk about this. This is awesome. I want to know about it. And I think that's what it comes down to. It's like, I want to know about the cool stuff. So to be vocal about that stuff. Uh, that means a lot of stuff. Like for a company, uh, blocking small improvements is awesome. Uh, you don't have to do this gigantic you know, version push to be able to market and talk to people about it. Uh, the, the good example there is 1Password again. You know, it's a small version update, but they still talked about it. GitHub has done this really well for pretty much since it started. All the founders earlier on were really good at blogging you know, a 10 line CSS change or something. And they say, hey, check out this new feature we have. Uh, it's cool, it's a very long tail. Somebody further down the line may be interested by that little change. And unless you sort of keep publicizing this, uh, it's just gonna slip away and you're, you're gonna not excite people like you could otherwise. Uh, leveraging regular press is really good if you're on the company side of things. Uh, what I mean is this. So this is the launch of the iPhone. Um, the text is way off, but January 9th, 2007, Steve got on stage and did his best keynote ever and he said, we have something called the iPhone, it's gonna be awesome, and it's gonna launch on June 29th. Awesome. That's what people like to think about what actually happened. But what Apple did here to get so many people excited about the iPhone was pretty remarkable. Uh, February 26th, they had the first TV ad, which didn't even show the product, it was just a bunch of people picking up the phone, uh, wasn't even their phone. Uh, June 3rd, they had four different TV ads that they all released. Uh, June 6th, they had another ad. June 11th, the WWDC, they announced the iPhone SDK. June 18th, they improved the battery and they announced it. And then June 18th, they improved the glass and they moved from a plastic screen 
uh, June 20th, they had a YouTube app announced, then they had another TV ad the next day, the next day they had a guided tour, then t four days later, all of the press could publish their reviews of the iPhone, and on that same day, they announced the plans. Uh, it's, it's nice to sort of think that Apple was just like, oh, here's the iPhone, now everyone wants it. But when you look back, like, they, they kept pushing this the entire time. And it's, it's, you could be cynical and say that this is bad, but I think it's kind of good just to say, yeah, we just always had something new that people could talk about. Uh, I find that really fascinating to see how they actually worked, and that's why people got so excited about it, I think. Um, once you've launched something, the, the next part is reaction. Uh, reaction is kind of the, the, the most fascinating about all of this stuff, I feel. Uh, people on the internet are dicks. I don't know if you've noticed this. They're, they're just horrible, horrible people. Um, and it's depressing, again, when I, you know, I'll see like a friend or something who are fantastic coders or somebody I follow on Twitter, and you know, just because they're not necessarily a public persona, they're really scared about saying, here's my awesome new blog or here's my new open source project because you're worried about these idiots on the internet you know, talking about you know, how horrible you're doing it. And it's like, well, I, I spent an hour hung over on a Sunday morning you know, this is my cool result, and somebody's going to be there to yell at you. It, it's depressing. Um, I see this a whole bunch. Someone goes on Hacker News, like, I've spent six months of my life on this awesome project, and the first comment is just like, fuck you! You're this, doing this wrong. You're using Ruby. You're not using Ruby. You're doing everything to horrible. Uh, this is the most depressing thing ever, and people just get so angry about just the dumbest stuff. Uh, that's sad. Um, so the question is, like, how much should you care about this? And... I think the answer is zero. Just literally do not care about this. Uh, but it's really hard to say that you know, I'm not impacted by anyone you know, talking crap about my cool library I spent months on. Uh, so I've sort of been thinking about this for the last year or two, and I kind of came up with this like a care theory idea. Uh, it means, like, should I care uh, about somebody's reaction to my, my stuff? And I think that's important because once you sort of identify what position someone's coming at and talking about your product or your open source library, whatever the case is, uh, you can start categorizing their feedback and wondering, oh, should I care about this or should I just ignore it because that's the state of affairs on the internet? Um, so how do you respond to feedback? I think that's the, the most critical aspect of this. Um, I'm sort of lumping it into three different groups. Uh, you can have fans of your stuff, you can have skeptics of your stuff, and then people who just hate on your stuff. Uh, and I think the percentages can be very relative depending on you know, what you're releasing and what people are interested in it. So you can have stuff with a lot of skeptics, a lot of haters. You can have stuff that everyone's just in love with and they love you to death. Uh, and then you can just release something and everyone's a hater. So there's, there's different ways of gauging reaction. Um, but that's necessarily, I don't really care about the amounts. I care about who these people are. So fans are probably going to be users of your site or your app or whatever product you are. Um, that's awesome. Fans are great. Uh, skeptics are people who could be users. Maybe they are. Maybe they don't use it that much. Uh, haters are usually not users. Uh, that's a good way to start out. And the question is, like, should you care about what these people are saying? Fans, yes. You should care about what your people who like your stuff are saying about it. Uh, skeptics, maybe. And haters, maybe as well. Um, so what does that actually mean? Uh, fans is easy enough. Like, yeah, my fans are going to use it. You should probably listen to what they have to say. Uh, skeptics are kind of interesting. Um, you know, be wary of people that say this. Like, I'll only use this if you add cats to it. Yeah, one star. Worst app ever. Doesn't have cats. Uh, so you're like, all right, all right. I'll add cats just for this guy. And then he'll be like, well, all right, now I'll use it if you had cats and Ajax. So you're like, all right, let me add Ajax. Now I got Ajax on cats. And he's like, all right, it has to be over web sockets. And it's like, these are the type of people that are just, it's, it, it, I see this again and again, and they're just like, if only you added this, then I will use it. And you have to do whatever I say, or otherwise I'm just not going to do it. Uh, GitHub in particular, like all the founders of GitHub were pretty good at this earlier on, because you had all these traditionally large open source projects saying, you know, I'll only use this if you add you know, some ridiculous hierarchical control of source control at that point. And they're like, OK, uh, no. And then six to 12 months later, the project decided it's not that big of a deal, and then they joined anyway. Uh, you'll see that a lot. We see that with a lot of our big enterprise customers. Where they'll say, we will not use this unless you add this, and we'll say no, and then you know, a week later they join anyway because it's not that big of a deal. Um, so you know, be wary of people that are just saying, you know, I'll use this if. 
you know, listen to what they want, and if that makes sense, add it, um, but don't be too stressed out if it doesn't meet your original plan. Um, and then the other group is haters. I think haters can be split into three separate subgroups. Uh, one is just they're unreachable. Uh, whatever product you're, you're building is just not applicable to them. Uh, I was at a, I gave a small talk at a development shop a year or two ago, and it was, uh, the, the, it was a website for maternity clothes or something like that. And I'm up there talking about pull requests and how GitHub does stuff, and I'm looking outside and it's literally all like 22 year old dudes. I'm like, you, you, you can't like use your product. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's fine. Uh, but you just have to realize that there are some people that just are not, you know, they're unreachable to your product. Um, so don't worry about them as much. Uh, there are other haters that may come around when you succeed. You'll see this all the time, uh, especially like when the iPhone came out, someone is like, oh, I just hate on this. And then a year or two later, they come back around and they have used your product and they're now big fans of it. Um, and then the rest is just assholes who just hate everything. And, you know, again, these are all relatives. Sometimes there's just a lot of assholes and, you know, it's horrible. These are the people you should worry about. Unreachable people, uh, you just can't reach them and it's not a big deal. Uh, they're just not going to use your stuff. And then just don't worry about the people who just hate on everything. Uh, worry about these people. Worry about the people who, um, you know, are disappointed in your stuff right away, but they may come around in the, the future. Um, so I think it's, it's, for me, it became really important to sort of discover the source of people's frustrations. If someone's immediately just saying, oh, you're horrible, this stuff is crap, uh, you know, look at their motivations and try and figure out which sort of group they get lumped into. And then you can easily say, oh, yeah, this guy, you know, I'm building something that just does not work for him. I can just ignore it, and it's not that big of a deal. It helps me sort of deal with, um, you know, really horrible people on the Internet sometimes. Um, so, yeah, not all feedback is equal. Uh, pay attention sometimes, but worry about who's saying it, uh, and then you can build stuff from there. Uh, and try not to worry about reaction. Uh, I, a lot of what I do when I go talking to people is to just say, do stuff. Uh, it's an awesome industry. There's lots of cool open source. There's lots of you know, stuff you can just go out and build like a company on your own tonight if you had a really good idea. Um, and it's, it kills me that there's this blocker of, well, you know, I'm nervous about what happens when it gets released in the world. Um, and, you know, if you can come up with better ways of figuring out how to handle that, uh, that's sort of the key to it all. Uh, I like to th just think, like, nothing great was ever not shipped. Uh, you know, it, t every great thing that you've used has gone through this cycle of someone hating on it or liking it or loving it. And, you know, that's sort of the step of the process to have to deal with the, that sort of stuff. Uh, so overall, I mean, building products is really hard. You have to deal with all of this sort of, you know, feedback loops and, you know, dealing with building out the company and then, you know, even the low-level stuff like what border radius should this element have. Uh, all of this stuff is really hard, but I think it's better off to build a product indirectly through your culture, through your team, through all of these different aspects of uh, your company rather than stressing too much about the details. Otherwise, you're just patching on, you know, tiny details on top of a, you know, sinking ship. Uh, that metaphor kind of fell down, but that's cool. Um, so people, culture, building desire, management, reaction, all this stuff ends up working for you if you can build a culture around all of this stuff. Uh, so that's what I've got. Thanks. Should we do questions? Yes. People are definitely being hard on Marissa Meyer right now, which is a bummer. Um, I, I go back and forth on what needs to be done there. Um, people have been asking me stuff because we're so ridiculously remote, like two-thirds of the company. So they naturally think that I'm going to be like, yeah, you know, she's doing it horribly. Um, I can see both sides. Uh, she's definitely in a position where she has to shake up Yahoo because it's, it's been bad for a long time. And, you know, she knows the company. And if, if it's a clear across the board that all remote workers are not productive, um, that makes sense. Um, on the flip side, I liked uh, 
uh, DHH's post yesterday or something where he's basically like, it was a minority of the company, like maybe 1% or something is remote. And, you know, shaking things up and saying, you know, magically now no one's remote and therefore it's going to be magically better isn't necessarily the best way to do things. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's hard because none of us know, unless you work for Yahoo, how things are actually working uh, in the actual company. Uh, I, naturally, I would side with, I like to build a, a culture of um, remote work that works for us, but on the other token, you know, we've been remote since the beginning. We didn't have an office for the first two years. And you know, trying to instill that culture after the fact when maybe Yahoo was broken inherently for the last decade, um, you know, maybe it just doesn't work for them. So, so the answer, I, I have no idea. And, you know, I, she'll figure it out, probably. Uh, so the question was about sane workloads with re regards to time estimation. Uh, so for GitHub, it's a little bit different because, again, I was saying that kind of goes hand in hand with uh, we don't have deadlines. We don't really, you know, we don't do any sort of specific agile stuff, so we don't have, like, you know, do this every day and stuff. Um, so for us, it's the sane workload sort of derives from, you know, I don't have to, you know, crush code tonight because, you know, tomorrow I can just work on it as normal. Um, that can be really dangerous if you have people who don't ship stuff. Like if it's, you know, everyone knows the types of projects that are just perpetually 90% complete and you just can't finish them. So that has to be paired with this culture of, you know, I really want to get this out as soon as possible, but not before it's done. Not before I'm really happy with it for being a good product and stuff like that. Um, so it's, it's really tricky to try and figure out a way to make a culture that isn't about um, you know, ridiculous workloads and stuff like that. Um, and it's especially difficult when, you know, you're at a company that, you know, money's a very real thing. Like, maybe you only have six months of a runway. That changes your perspective dramatically. Um, and that's, we're sort of reaching the benefit of not having to deal with that. Um, so it's, it's a lot of different stuff, I guess. Um, yes. Uh, I, I talk a lot more specifically about how we work at GitHub, and usually somebody will ask, you know, how does this work for consultancies? And I'm like, you can't. Like, it's, you, you just have a boss that is not you. And inherently, like, there are certain things you can do to, to sort of embrace kind of this type of work, but, um, you know, maybe you can get 80% of the way there, but at the end of the day, like, you're, you're, you know, you're responsible to somebody else external to the company, and, you know, that's just sort of the, the trade-offs of working that, you know, sort of consultancy stuff, so. Mm -hmm. um, so, most of all that stuff is ha handled by the founders. We have four founders, uh, effectively, who sort of handle all, you know, promotions. Well, we don't, you don't get promoted because there's nowhere to promote to which is kind of nice. Like, we don't have titles. We don't have, like, VPs of anything, uh, which is kind of nice just because, you know, you don't have to worry about that. Um, but, like, bonuses, salaries, all of that stuff is handled by them, and it's not necessarily, I mean, that big of a deal. Uh, we're at 150 people. No one's quit or left the company ever. So it, it's not been something that we've stressed out about. Um, so the, the question was about what questions we asked during the hiring process to try and figure out who would be a good fit. Uh, we've run into this a, a number of times now. Well, like, not a whole lot. Basically, we've had to let go a few people because they were, they were great developers, they were great at what they do, but they didn't work in a sort of directionless, uh, you know, figure out what you want to work and ship and do all that sort of stuff. Uh, so we've been trying to figure out better ways of figuring out, you know, would you be successful in a way that you know, doesn't have a manager in that type of company. Um, so we look at a lot of stuff. By the time you come in for an interview, we usually know a whole bunch about you based on 
you know, your, your open source work. We like to hire people who work on open source because that kind of shows like, you know, you probably like to do stuff um, on your own timetable, uh, which is really helpful for us. Um, it's also good for us specifically because we like people who work on open source on github.com because you should probably use our own product and stuff. Um, so that's, that's helpful for us. Um, you can ask, I don't know, I guess there's certain questions you can ask to figure out, like literally just ask them, you know, what do you want to work on at GitHub? Um, because that's what you have to ask yourself the whole time. Um, I'm sort of the, the weirdest example at GitHub because I've probably done four separate jobs. Um, and it takes, you know, stepping back and saying, what do I want to work on? Um, what am I most interested by? And you can sort of shake people out in terms of, you know, does that frighten them? Does that paralyze them? Or do, are they just like, usually what we end up seeing is everyone's like, oh, I want to work on this, but I want to work on this, and I got this to do, and there's just too many things to work on. Um, so it's, it's not a simple, you know, yes or no question, I guess, but it's, it's one of those things you can get a feel for somebody once you talk to them in person and figure out, you know, what their motivations are, I guess. Um, a number of different ways. Uh, we have, we try to keep the level of high level communication up pretty high. Um, so we have an internal app called Team, which is kind of like a Twitter clone slash, um, you know, you're encouraged to post like short updates. Like I'm working on, you know, email delivery today. Uh, and usually that's enough context to where someone else is like, hey, you know, I did this on this other project. Let me help you out with that, or let's make sure that we're using the same libraries or not duplicating stuff. Um, and then we also have, on that same app, very long form ideas. We can get into a lot more detail about, you know, wouldn't it be great if we had X at GitHub, where X is a product idea? Um, and at that point, before I've started coding on it, we can get a lot of feedback on, yeah, this doesn't make any sense because, you know, we did this component two years ago and, you know, that didn't work. Or, um, so it's really just a matter of communicating really well. Uh, we've been able to, to self-select into different teams um, pretty well, so if you're working on a project and you want to take it a different direction, that's the people uh, who will tend to know, you know, if you're duplicating effort, uh, just the, the team around you. Um, so I guess it's, you know, it's high level across com company communication is important, and then just low level within your team is also really important. But again, you know, no magic bullet, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Um, so the question is, how do you integrate new employees into the mishmash of what we do? Um, it's one, like we're very public with how we work, which I think helps. Um, people are able to see very clearly, like this is how they work, so I can sort of crash study this. Uh, two, every single person has to spend the first week uh, at GitHub, um, usually with a buddy. So we'll assign you and be like, all right, you, you know, you'll pair, pair up on your project or you know, whatever you're doing with a certain person. And you spend the whole week in San Francisco sort of figuring out the ropes. Um, and that is really probably the most helpful thing we do. Um, and then finally, we have just a lot of documentation internally on very much specifics like, you know, here's how we write tests at GitHub is in doc slash testing.md. Um, and it's, so it's just a lot of, you know, looking at talks, looking at stuff we've written internally. Um, there's a lot of stuff to do. So either, uh, you know, external stuff, uh, before you, you know, read some of my blog posts or some of the talks that Scott or Tom has done, um, and then the buddy system when you join has been really helpful for us. All right, yeah, I'll be around. Cool. Thanks.